In 1971, Nolan Bushnell unloaded the first arcade cabinet for computer space into the Stanford University bar, Dutch Goose. Computer Space was one of the first coin-operated arcade video games. When it turned on, players were treated to a crude facsimile of outer space, filled with stars. Those stars were the first video game sprites, and the first pixel art. Video games prior to this year were academic projects, drawn with vector-based graphics rather than pixels. They weren't played on a television screen, but on vector displays and oscilloscopes, presented as points of light and the lines connecting them, with infinite resolution but no detail. What separated computer space from the earlier games was that computer space outputted video to a 15-inch General Electric television set, the same kind of consumer electronics everyday people could buy for their homes. This meant that to display graphics, computer space had to go through a raster. A persistent grid of horizontal scan lines created when an electron gun draws a pattern across the phosphor coating on a cathode ray tube television set, which the human eye then perceives as light. Just three years before, the development of mass memory integrated circuits by physicist Federico Fagin made a previously theoretical technology possible. A frame buffer, which could store a map of bits or bitmap containing the data for all of the pixels in a single frame of animation, and transmit it to a television screen as a video signal. But when Bushnell was cobbling computer space together in his daughter's bedroom, frame buffers were still not practical technology, so he had to program computer space to draw every pixel line by line, and he did it using transistor to transistor logic chips. Most pixel artists throughout the 1970s would create their graphics using machine code or similarly low-level assembly language, still to draw each game's graphics line by line. Even when the first home consoles arrived in 1977, none of them had frame buffers until the Intellivision in 79, and arcade boards didn't standardize them until Taito's 1978 Space Invaders. As a result, the pixel art of the 70s prioritized function over form. Graphics were usually monochrome, and readable silhouettes were more useful than aesthetically pleasing character designs. In the arcade, the surrounding hardware often played a role in assisting each game's visual presentation, providing fake color using strips of tinted cellophane laid over the monitor, and supplementary artwork that fed the player's imagination. Space Invaders was a watershed moment for the monochromed games of its day, using its frame buffer to display more carefully designed characters, aliens that you could even call cute. Those invaders sparked an invader boom in Japan, which helped establish the country's first arcades, at the time called Invader Houses. Enterprising business owners would buy dozens of Space Invaders cocktail cabinets and serve food and drinks to players to double dip on revenue, and even normal businesses had to have one or two cabinets lying around, or one of the many ripoffs that emerged in the newly created a genre of STG, shooting games. The Invader Boom was eventually overtaken in 1979 by Namco's Galaxian. Galaxian was Namco's first game to support RGB color, capable of displaying red, green, and blue, and mixing the colors of light to produce a broader spectrum in much the same way a painter would mix pigments. This was followed by Pac-Man and Galaga in 1980 and 81, which demonstrated the advantages of pixel art sprites, or stamps as they were known back then. While sprites could not be infinitely scaled up or down like plotted point vectors, they possessed a far greater range of information, where vectors were limited to displaying wireframes and silhouettes. For that reason, by the start of the 1980s, pixel art was the industrial standard for video games. 1983 was the key year for this new art form. It was in this year that the great video game crash forced all eight game console manufacturers out of the business in the United States, leaving only the arcade industry standing, while the job market for console development collapsed. This extinction of the American console business made way for Nintendo to sweep in during the latter half of the decade and establish a functional monopoly on the console market that would last until the middle of 1991. But at the same time that console games were crashing in the Americas, in Japan Nintendo was introducing the public to the Family Computer, or Famicom, an advanced home game console with a frame buffer, hardware scrolling, and a powerful processor that made it easy to port cutting-edge arcade games like Donkey Kong, Dig Dug, and Xevious. It took the Famicom about 16 months to really catch on, with Namco's Xevious becoming one of its early must-have titles in Japan. Selling 1.26 million copies and helping kick off the Famicom boom, where developers flocked to be the first to join Nintendo's platform. 
Before the Famicom boom and for some time after, Japanese developers focused on making games for Microsoft's new MSX and next PC8800 and 9801 home computers, which had huge amounts of random access memory available so they could support what were then very high resolution color displays of 640x200 pixels. At the time, computer standards in the West focused on 320x200 pixel displays, and higher resolutions of 640x200 or 512x342 did not support color graphics at all, which is how Mac gamers of the era ended up with titles like Dark Castle and Shadowgate that had to convey a huge amount of detail using no colors. Higher res displays were necessary in Japan because written Japanese was a much more visually complex language with many nuances to its written characters. Thus, the MSX and PC-88 or 98 were both built around 64 kilobytes of RAM as a standard. The sprite art of the day was tailored to each platform's limitations. The PC-88 was limited to 8 RGB colors made from maxing out the red, green, and blue values in different combinations, but it received a gaming-focused hardware revision in 1985 called the Mark II SR, which had 512 possible colors but could still only display 8 at a time. Its 16-bit big brother, the PC-98, could display up to 16 colors on screen from a pool of over 4,000. Meanwhile, the MSX had a fixed palette of 16 colors and could display all of them, but only 2 per sprite. The 1985 MSX2 revision introduced a new function where when two sprites overlapped, a new color could be produced from them. The pixel artists at Konami would go on to make the company the face of MSX game development through their incredible use of bonus colors in the sprite work for Vampire Killer and Metal Gear. In general, game developers gravitated towards the hardware that was at the best intersection of power and affordability. Creating games for the MSX and PC-88 was attractive, because it was cheap and thus had a bigger market share than cutting-edge hardware like the PC-98 and much later Sharp X68K. The PC-98 was also backwards compatible with PC-88 floppy disks, so games written for the Little Brother computer could also run on the Big Brother. The art produced for these platforms reflected their strengths. The PC-88 is where the visual novel was born, because it couldn't do smooth scrolling and it refreshed the screen at a low rate compared to arcade boards and game consoles, but it had a lot of memory and a high resolution for displaying beautiful still images and written Japanese. While analog artists had been painting in oil for over 500 years, tempera for more than 800, and watercolor since antiquity, the tools used by pixel artists evolved rapidly in the 1980s and 90s. Until 1985, pixel art was usually created by first drafting a sprite on graph paper and then assigning the color values in assembly or machine language. This was feasible because the early color arcade boards, the MSX, PC-88, and even the Famicom had a very small number of colors to work with. With today's comprehensive image editors, if you want a specific color, you can manipulate the red, green, and blue or hue saturation values directly to create what you want, but in this period you would enter a four-digit hex value and create an entire tile of that color by repeatedly entering the same value into all 16 pixels in a single bitmap. With the advent of the 8801 Mark II SR and MSX II in 1985 and 86, the range of usable colors increased to 512, and this exponential increase necessitated a dedicated graphics editor that could simplify the process of choosing a palette. The weapon of choice varied by studio and platform. The same year the Mark II came out, Commodore introduced the world to the Amiga PC and the raster graphics editor, Deluxe Paint. Deluxe Paint was advantageous for game artists because it natively supported the indexed color format commonly used by the industry, and depending on the mode it was run in could do either 16 or 32 color bitmaps chosen from a range of 4096 colors, meaning it could do all the colors available on the 88 Mark II, PC-98, MSX2, and Famicom. Japanese businesses tended to use a mix of computers to create their games, with PC-88s and 98s, Fujitsu FMs, and Hewlett Packard 64Ks all coexisting in the same offices. Some companies like Namco and Hudson Soft even had developers build their own PCs as part of a training exercise. As pixel art became more complex, it became common for pixel artists to use different computers from programmers and sound engineers. An artist might be drawing the sprites on an Amiga, while the lead programmer did the coding on an HP 64K, and the game's soundtrack was made on the actual Famicom unit the game would be tested on using Family Basic and the keyboard peripheral. This is similar to how Super Mario Bros. 3 was made. The programming was done on multiple 64Ks, while the sprites and tiles were made on a Fujitsu FMR50. Once the Famicom boom began in late 1984, developers started porting their popular MSX and arcade games like Vampire Killer, The Tower of Druaga, and 1942 to the Famicom, before beginning earnest development of new Famicom titles with no PC or arcade equivalents. The market, and the art made for the market, 
consolidated around Nintendo. The next six years would define not just one period of pixel art, but an entire body of aesthetics that would be studied, replicated, deconstructed, and rebuilt by pixel artists for decades to come.